Well, um, good evening. Uh, that I'm pleased that you can join us uh, both online and uh, for the first time uh, in three years in person uh, for the Glasgow University Medieval History Edwards Lecture. Um, I am Andrew Roach and what I will be doing is just explaining a little bit about Edwards and then I'll hand over to my colleague Professor Sam Cohn to introduce our distinguished speaker. Um, John Edwards, who, whose bequest uh, enables this lecture, was a Glasgow businessman. Um, he originally trained as a lawyer, um, but then was I think more or less compelled reading between the lines uh, into the family firm, a, a, a firm of dyers, the, the, um, but he never lost his consistent interest in medieval history. Uh, and in fact, that having made a fortune by his mid fifties, he then um, retired and spent a long and profitable the, the, um, third career um, producing academic work, uh, primarily on the religious orders, the Templars, the Gilbertines, uh, and the Franciscan friars, um, that before dying and leaving a substantial legacy to uh, Glasgow University uh, for the promotion of medieval history. That included uh, a chair, the, the, which uh, unfortunately at the moment is not filled, but also a legacy for an annual uh, lecture. And that it is this that we are, are doing today. That, um, so I, I'm, I'm sure the, that uh, John Edwards would have been delighted with uh, today's speaker. And I'll hand you over to my colleague, Sam Cohn, to introduce him. Thank you very much. Thanks, Andrew, um, and good evening. It gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Bruce Campbell. Um, it, uh, especially since we've been waiting for uh, over two years, uh, it's, a, it's a great pleasure to see, see you again. I, he, Bruce uh, has all sorts of accolades. He's a fellow of the British Academy, a member of the Royal Irish Academy, a member of the Academia Europae. And if you wanna know more, uh, just Google him. Uh, I, I will add one, and that is, I think uh, that Bruce, it's, well, it's very difficult for me to think of people who have changed the face of medieval history as much as Bruce has in the last uh, uh, 30 or 40 years. Um, now, I'm trying to remember this. This is sort of in the, the haze of my memory of when I first met Bruce. I think it was at the Memorial Conference for Rodney Hilton. And I can tell you it's a, a rather, introductions to Bruce can be rather perilous. Uh, this was an introduction, I think, by Chris Dyer. Again, I don't, to me, just to me saying, and, and, and Sam, of course, you know the prominent uh, medieval historian, Bruce Campbell. And Bruce said he corrected him, but uh, not for the prominent part, but a medieval historian said, I'm a geographer. And in fact, uh, Bruce's education is very much uh, in this and his first appointments are as a geographer, not as a historian per se. His first degree at Liverpool was in geography. And then he went on to, uh, uh, to um, Cambridge and got his PhD in historical geography. His first job at uh, Queens Belfast in uh, 1973 was in geography. Uh, and then he has spent the rest of his career at Queens uh, uh, Belfast. Uh, and at one point, and I think that Bruce did tell me about this conversion, and I've forgotten the story of his conversion from uh, being in the Department of Geography to being in the Department of Economic History. And this happened as a reader and then as, as a PhD and now as, as uh, a professor emeritus of economic history. Uh, um, okay, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So he, he is a medievalist. And uh, I don't think he would object as he's just testified to that, but he's a medievalist of a certain sort, and not only in his quantitative interests, but also in really, he's more of a 
of a medievalist of the long durée, of the long duration. And we, one can, like his, his famous past and present article on uh, field systems in uh, Norfolk uh, of, of 1993 in past and present that goes from, what is it, 1270 to uh, 1870, or his last two books that I know about, and he can correct me, there's probably another one that I've forgotten, but there's the British e e economic growth, 1270 to 1870 in 2015. And then in the very next year, he produced what we all thought was Bruce's swan song, uh, but he's proven us wrong. The, the, the great transition, climate, disease, and society in late medieval, in the late medieval world. But this is chronologically modest because really he really begins in this discussion of uh, all these techniques going into prehistory and the book goes into at least the 17th century. I now like to be a little uh, maybe perverse and I, I had a wager with Bruce on this. I, I think that Bruce, one of his big turning points and I think maybe his most important one is in praise of a book he did uh, in uh, 1991 as the editor. And now in the, in the, in the period of, 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 of ref and then in, and, and graduate uh, awards and, and CVs and all of this, things first essays in prominent journals like past and present economic history review and then monographs are the things that count and what don't count so much anymore are chapters and collective books or, or, um, or being editor of, a, um, of, of, of one of these uh, um, anthologies. And this is a book called Before the Black Death. And it had some all-star participants like John Monroe and Barbara Harvey and Richard Smith. But what's really remarkable, I think, about this book is that it was, to use an overused word, a game changer, a real shift in Black Death Studies. Because before that, what was re the reigning paradigm going back to the 1950s was the Malthusian versus Marxist debate. And probably reaching its high point with uh, 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 the Brenner debate, uh, which the Brenner's article in 76, but then the debate in 92, uh, which puts together this. But all right at that moment, this book really shifts the terrain. It shifts the terrain, if I can use the, these words, uh, from a, really a concentration, whether you're a Malthusian or a Marxist, on endogenous variables of what people do. Whereas this book already sets the stage for what Black studies, Black death studies have become, particularly in the 21st century, which are mainly about exogenous variables. And this is, I think, really the real shift in that approach. And of course, now I think we're grappling with new ways to put together human agency and uh, uh, these external or ex exogenous variables like climate or the world of pathogens that are not wholly, wholly dependent on what people do. Um, so I'll, I'll end, end this short, uh, introduction by uh, looking at his, his paper, which I very much am interested in and in seeing. And this really, I just do think, will jive with Edward's bequest because it has to do, Bruce tells me, with things in paleography. And even if it didn't, it's this whole notion of archival studies, which is very interesting about the construction of archives, about what can be done, about the disappearance of archives, which of course, given what's happening in the world today is a very important consideration. So I'd like us to introduce, to uh, welcome uh, Bruce uh, to uh, Glasgow and uh, take it away. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's, um, I'm here two years uh, later than was originally intended. Um, I was all set to come, flights were booked, and then Mr. COVID arrived. Um, I got scared, fly BE went bust, and I didn't think anybody would come and sit in the lecture theater with a pandemic about to erupt. 
And because I had studied the Black Death, I had some idea of what was in store for us all and have been warning people this was not going to be over in a few months. And I know all about the bell-shaped curve of, that pandemics take with their infections and their, and their uh, mortality. The delay, I think, or the postponement has made what I'm going to say, I think, a little bit more topical, as I hope will um, uh, become clear in a moment. But I'm just going to, um, uh, as Sam has been so kind in his introduction, to just explain one little point that I think is, um, um, uh, he has missed. When I became a lecturer in geography in the Queen's University of Belfast in 1973, the geography department was in the Faculty of Science. And I spent my first 16 years as an academic in a faculty of science. Now, if you're a medieval economic historian, try and get promoted in a faculty of science when you're competing, you know, they're sitting looking at all the different promotion profiles at, at what a scientist will produce with their teams and their grants and what I could produce. So I negotiated a transfer to the Department of Economic History, which was in the Faculty of Social Science, and in a twinkling of an eye, I became a professor. It just, I, I, my round peg was finally in a round hole and was recognized as such. So um, that's, uh, uh, so be warned, it was nice to have a job, but it was better to have one in a sympathetic faculty. Um, now, um, is this going to work? Hang on. Uh, this is a lecture, it's a, uh, as I've come a long way to give it and waited two years, I'm going to give you value for money, as I used to say to my students, I don't believe in shortchanging an audience. Um, so it, it comes with a prologue, four parts, very clearly flagged up, and when I get to part four, I'm on the home straight and you can start relaxing. And there's a very short epilogue at the end. Um, um, uh, and the premise of this lecture, given that it's the Edwards lecture, is what can historians do, especially medieval historians do, when their national archive is destroyed? As happened in Ireland exactly 100 years ago, this is the 100th anniversary of the destruction of the Public Record Office of Ireland. And of course, it what is now happening is the destruction of cultural heritage in the Ukraine. So wars don't just kill human beings, they destroy culture, records, and all the rest of it. Uh, and then the historians are left picking up the pieces and trying to make sense of the past with what has not perished um, in, the, in the destruction. Um, and so it was on the 30th of June, uh, 1922, that the Public Record Office, which was located in purpose-built premises in the Four Courts building uh, in Dublin, you still see the Four Courts building when you go to Dublin, it's, uh, it's remade, reconstructed, architecturally as was, um, uh, and it was destroyed during the Civil War uh, between the anti-treaty forces, those that did not want partition of the creation of a six-county Northern Ireland. Um, they had holed up in the four courts with their arsenal and they had stored their arsenal in the record repository. And they were besieged by the pro-treaty forces, that's Michael Collins and co, and a shell from the pro-treaty forces landed in the treasury and detonated. Um, the arsenal of the anti-treaty forces uh, was triggered and that led to a colossal fire. Um, and uh, you see a contemporary photograph of the four courts there beside the Liffey um, on fire. Here's the treasury, um, purpose-built, top-lit, uh, many floors designed to be fireproof, but not designed to be bomb-proof. And here survived um, the surviving records of the English administration of the English Lordship of Ireland. Now, they had had quite a, a checkered history before they got there. Um, there had been uh, various places they'd been stored before, had been attacked, burnt, and so forth. So they had had quite a lot of setbacks before they were placed along with records from all subsequent centuries in the Public Record Office of Ireland. And as well as the treasury, there was the reading room, and, the, and between the reading room and the treasury was a fire break. 
and, and, and there ringed, you see, Herbert Wood, the deputy keeper uh, of the public records, um, presiding over uh, the, uh, the, the reading room. This is before family history caught on. Notice how agreeably empty the reading room is. You're not having to jostle family historians out of the way, as I did when I was doing my research in English uh, record offices uh, once family history took over. And um, it had been opened in 1867, and this is what happened after the bomb. This is what was left on, uh, 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 on the 1st of July, 1922. So I expect you all on the 30th of June to wear a black armband, please. 100 years ago on the 30th of, of, of June. And Herbert Wood, three months later, extraordinary thing for an archivist to do, wrote a lament on what had gone up in smoke. Uh, in Studies in Irish Quarterly Review. This was published in September 1922, just three months um, after the destruction. Um, and he says, the very centralization of the documents has proved their undoing. And at one blow, the records of centuries have passed into oblivion. Until then, the documents have been scattered around in private archives. They had a perfect public record. They brought them all together. And that was their undoing. Had they remained scattered, some of them might have perished, but not all of them would have, uh, would have perished. And so historians of medieval Ireland have spent the last 100 years recovering from this catastrophe. And I, I kind of think for the first generation, it was a great excuse for putting your hands in your pockets and saying, well, of course, we'd love to go to the archive, but it doesn't exist any longer, but keep paying me my salary. Uh, but, of course, not everything has been lost. Um, and so since 1922, historians have made resort to a growing number of alternative sources of evidence. And so in this lecture, I want to extend perhaps Edward's idea of what sources and evidence are for the Middle Ages to include some non-documentary sources as well as the documentary ones. The historical record for the Middle Ages is rich, but, it's, but it goes way beyond the written record, as I hope to show in this lecture. So what has survived? Copies, transcripts, and facsimiles of the incinerated, incinerated documents, transcripts made by antiquarians. The published calendars, which at least tell us in outline what was there and contain some of the information. And the reports of the deputy keepers, which, for example, tell us the revenues the customs revenues raised at the individual customable ports in Ireland from 1285, but don't give the breakdown of what the customs was levied on. But it means there's a lot of useful information uh, there. There were records preserved in other archives, Irish civic archives, there's hugely important documents in uh, the Dublin City Archive, uh, which has always remained separate. And one of the most remarkable documents surviving in these islands is preserved there. Um, the Gill Merchant Roll from 1190 to 1265, which I'm currently working on. Uh, uh, records in institutional and ecclesiastical archives. So there are important collections of the Royal Irish Academy um, in the uh, Armagh Diocesan Collection and in other, in other collections. And what did not perish, because they were Irish, truly Irish, were the Irish annals. And there's a wonderful project now to make the contents of the Irish annals fully available online via what is called CELT, C-E-L-T, easily remembered. So if you want to do a Google for University College Cork, CELT, it will take you to full English transcripts, searchable and digitized for uh, most of the main Irish annals, uh, which is a, a remarkable continuous record spanning from the 7th to the 17th centuries. Um, way before there was anything for England, it was vast and superior, um, and that has survived. Uh, there was a, because unlike Scotland, um, the Lordship of Ireland was subordinate to government in Westminster, many of the records of the Irish Lordship were sent to Westminster and the accounts of the Lordship were summarized there. So you can get those through the pipe rolls preserved in the National Archive. And there's a lot of Irish material because it's meant a journey to England, it wasn't used very much for a long time. Um, um, so that has survived. Then we have 
the names of townlands in Ireland, which there are many thousands, and the name, personal names. And these have been used to reconstruct where settlers from outside of Ireland came, which, uh, which parts of Ireland were colonized, the names of the people, and these survive in later records, but the naming goes back to the English settlement of the 12th and 13th centuries. Now, are the actual physical remains of medieval buildings and settlements, and these are now being um, harnessed in a huge success uh, story of the, the Irish Historic Towns Atlas um, run from the Royal Irish Academy, which has produced many studies of the, it, the physical evolution of Irish towns and cities, numbers of which were founded in the Middle Ages, and these would be the subject of great scholarly study. Um, there were coins which in the hands of the right numismatist can tell you a huge amount. Um, uh, and there is a mounting body of scientifically retrieved archaeological and bioarchaeological evidence. And for me, as an economic historian, the most exciting new information is coming from work by my colleague at Queen's, uh, Eileen Murphy, from bioarchaeological analysis of skeleton remains um, from cemeteries. She can tell you about the age at which people died, the ailments the, for, by which they were afflicted, what their diets were, how much fish they ate, information about very ordinary, humble peasant people in the countryside that no medieval document would ever record. And this is pr uh, uh, proving quite revelatory about the material condition of life of people in the Irish countryside. Um, and then there are Ireland's natural archives of our peat bogs, which contain pollen and preserved oak timbers from which you can get tree rings, which can be dated exactly by the year. So we have a lot. Now, just before the, dis the destruction of the public record office of Ireland, uh, Goddard Henry Orpen had published the last of his four volume study, Ireland under the Normans, 1169 to 1333. Um, nowadays, we would not call it such. We would say it was Ireland under the English. So calling it the Normans slightly sanitizes it. Um, they came from England, not from Normandy. It was the King of England who came to Ireland, Henry II, in 1171. And this begins the English connection, which of course still endures in my part of Ireland to this, uh, to this day. And so he finished that um, in 1120. And then, hey presto, two, year, two years later, the public record office is destroyed. Um, um, and um, and um, he was a, a lawyer, a Protestant, and a unionist at the height of the home rule crisis in Ireland. And all historians write for the audiences there of their own day. So he wrote a history of the English in Ireland as a unionist and a Protestant who did not want home rule or anything like that. And this informs his history. Uh, and this is the beginning of the historiography of this period. And he says, Due credit, I'm really disappointed that Nicola Sturgeon is not at the room at the moment, due credit has not been given to the English crown and its ministers in Ireland for creating the comparative peace and order and the manifest progress and prosperity that Ireland enjoyed during the 13th century and indeed up to the invasion of Edward Bruce in the year 1315, whenever their rule was effective. It was the Scots, you see, who spoiled it all in 1315. Um, uh, and what I want to do in the rest of this lecture is see, does that still stand the test of time if we bear upon it these alternative types of evidence I've just listed and sketched uh, for you. Um, so this is the first part of my four-part lecture, and it means going back to Ireland before the English came, uh, there was an initial uh, invasion by, uh, by Strongbow in the 1169, and that so alarmed Henry II that he came uh, two years later in 1171. Um, uh, and, what, and what was Ireland like before then and what happened afterwards? According to Orpen, Ireland before uh, the Normans and the English arrived, was stagnant socially, economically, nothing was happening. It needed the English to make things happen and launched on the car on the path to progress. Okay, so the thing about the 12th century is 
right the way across Europe, it's a time of tremendously expanding economic opportunities. And it's within this context, the European wide context, I, uh, uh, what I'm now going to say, I want it to be seen, and I'll be coming back to that European uh, context. Um, uh, the commercial revolution, uh, written about famously by Robert Lopez, um, uh, an author that Sam very much will, whose work he will know, um, uh, uh, seemed taken up by a wonderful global study uh, of the world system of commerce by Janet Abulukod. Um, uh, the, it, uh, a part of it was... Uh, a revolution in business methods. And then I pick up these, this is a bit of an ego trip, uh, my book, The Great Transition, where I pick up on this period of commercial revolution, which embraced Europe and, and most of the known world at that point in time, and which was going really strong in the 12th century at the very point where the English invaded Ireland. And the key components of this, each of these could be a lecture. I'm just gonna list them as bullet points. Um, church reform, leading to the creation of, of a Pax Christiana across Europe. One church, one language, Latin. Um, uh, uh, international institutions, systems of monastic houses uh, that provide a network for spreading knowledge and information and travel and communication. And uh, uh, Michael Mann says, it enabled more produce to be traded over longer distances than could usually occur between the domains of such a large number of small, often highly predatory states and rulers. This is a kind of precursor of the European Union. You know, reducing borders so you can have more trade between constituent states. Um, uh, a church reform facilitated that. There was town foundation and urban growth. There was the establishment of both commodity and factor markets. Now, 20 years ago, I hadn't a clue what a factor market was. The economists were always talking about factor markets. I had no idea what they were. I knew what a commodity market was. That's you go to a shop and you buy sweeties, cigarettes, potatoes. A commodity market is what all capitalist economies need. They're markets in land, markets in labor, and markets in capital, the factors of production. And, and, and you need a, 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 the right legal institutional infrastructure for those kind of markets to develop, and they develop in this period. There were innovations in business, in business methods, um, double entry bookkeeping, use of Arabic numerals, bills of exchange. Um, uh, these, these are all innovations of, uh, of the, the 12th and the early 13th century. There is increased commercialization of all economic relationships as more people become more dependent on, upon the market for more of their livelihoods. And this really goes against the old Marxist view that there were lords and serfs and people were trapped and so forth. So there's, um, people are much more involved in the market. For me. And ordinary humble poor people are using the market in order to survive, in order to subsist. Um, uh, and underpinning all of this in Europe is rising European silver output. This is the oil of the 12th century, the silver of the European mines, because there's a big trade deficit between Europe and Asia, and the deficit was made good by the export of silver bullion from, from, from mines. And that under, uh, underpinned the, uh, the growth of minting and the increasing use of, uh, of coins. For, and, and once you can have monetary transactions, you can have multilateral trade rather than barter is clumsy and awkward, it's bilateral. To have multilateral trade, you need currency uh, for that to develop. And this feeds into an expansion of trade at all levels. And this is what Jan Janet Abu Lugod um, charts, um, this wonderful interlocking world system of trade. Here's Ireland right on the geographical periphery of it. We're right on the edge of it uh, in Ireland. Scotland uh, also pretty much uh, on the edge. Beyond both, of, of course, are Iceland and Greenland, both of which are linked into this commercial system to some extent. And um, if we use the Dublin Guild Merchant Roll, which I've been working on recently, this remarkable document that begins around about 1190 and goes on annually until 1265, and it tells you for six out of 10 people who became guildsmen in Dublin where they came from. And we can see that men were coming 
um, to become guildsmen in Dublin so they could trade there. They were coming from Aachen and Cologne in Germany, from Antwerp and Bruges in Flanders, from Paris, Bordeaux, Toulouse and Lyon in France, from Pamplona and Cordova in Spain, and from Lucca and Prato in Italy. And they're all falling within this orbit one, this European orbit of commerce. So you can see how Dublin is linking into that. And, they, and I just point each of these slides, you can all read, okay? There's a little box on my slides and it's telling you where the evidence is coming from. And this is the evidence that was not incinerated in 1922. So if you look at the box, I'm not gonna read these out. I have too much to say, um, but these will tell you what the evidence is of where it's coming from. So this is the Dublin Guild Merchant Roll from the Dublin City Archives. Um, and from the opposite extreme, and there's a wonderful piece of evidence, this is from a Latin uh, work on the art of the hunting of birds, preserved in the Vatican Museum and written in the 1240s. And, it, and ornithologists got really excited when they realized this depiction at the top uh, is, um, is actually an Australian yellow-crested white cockatoo, and it was given to Frederick II of Sicily by the Sultan of Babylon. Well, this is where the birdie came from. And this is probably the route the birdie in its cage took. And it gets to, it gets to, it gets to Baghdad and then it's sent, and, it, and you can see it, it ends up at the point of intersection between orbits one and orbits two. You can see how trade is connected between Ireland. A trickle of these exotic commodities reached Ireland uh, and, and other things. Ireland's contribution was wool, which went into cheap cloths, which was sold into Mediterranean markets. Uh, and this is the 12th century world that we're talking about. It is a globalized, uh, interacting uh, world. And across Europe, the growth generated by this commercial revolution found expression in, in a widespread building boom, especially the erection of ever larger urban churches. And this is a terrific project I did with some colleagues in Utrecht, which was measuring church building across seven European countries and quantifying it. And this is uh, the result we got. In the background is a big church. It's been rather in the news because it's 12th century roof burnt off three years ago and is in the process of being, of being uh, rebuilt. Um, so we can look at the absolute amount of church building, which as you can see goes right up. And then we can look at it per person, okay? And, and the per person church building is slowing down when uh, by the uh, end of the 13th century. And so we have this building boom, which is a manifestation of the tremendous commercial dynamism and the wealth being generated at this time. Well, a rising tide lifts all ships. And from the 1020s, there is clear evidence that Ireland was ex experiencing the same quickening of economic tempo as uh, much of the rest of Europe. So Ireland is not left out of this, it is, becomes part of it. And it becomes part of it in part because the Vikings have arrived and established trading ports, um, and Dublin is uh, one of them. So here is a, a quotation uh, from an essay by Benjamin Hudson. In the Irish Sea province, there was a precocious development. By the end of the 10th century, commerce was controlled largely by a few ports, market towns, which often had mints and fleets. By the end of the 11th century, the rapid commercial development throughout the rest of the North Atlantic Europe had caught up to the Irish Sea province, which then developed within the general rate of economic change found elsewhere in Europe. So Ireland is not a becomes backwater, not part of these trends. According to Benjamin Hudson, it's very much uh, part of these trends. And part of the evidence of this comes from coins. Uh, and this is a piece uh, work by uh, the numismatist Andrew Woods. Um, here is a coin minted by King Citric, um, a king of Dublin, a Norse king of Dublin in the 11th century. And Andrew Wood says from his study of coins minted in Dublin, the earliest coin from Dublin dates to the late 9th century. There was a peak in coin use in the middle of the 11th century. It is likely that this represented both an expanding economy and an increasingly monetized environment. Other archaeological proxies suggest that the 11th century was a boom time for the town. It roughly doubled in size between 1000 and 1100, 
Several churches were founded and there is archeological evidence for economic specialization. And occurring alongside this economic growth was the emergence of a monetary mentality within the town. Um, so if this is an economic dynamism, I don't know, I don't know uh, uh, what is. And you could say, okay, well, this is just a Viking town. So a half a dozen of them around the coast. But then there was this work by Thomas, his uh, archeologist, Thomas O'Carrigan, um, who studied a very neglected um, uh, structure, but the very plain, small little stone churches that were built all over Ireland, which survived usually in ruinous state. And you see them in the landscape. They've been ignored by almost everybody before him, and he's made a close study of them. And then he studied references to them in the, in the surviving Irish annals. And here is a graph, a count of references to churches in the Irish annals. And, and, and two things stand out from the graph. Um, the first is the change from green, which are churches built of timber, to, um, to blue, which are churches built of stone. So it's the change in the material from which the churches are constructed. And secondly, the numbers. And you see that from about 1020, the numbers of church references to churches in the annals go up and up and up and up. And this is independent research by one scholar, and this is the work I did with my colleagues in Utrecht for European church building that does not include Ireland. And this is wonderful. It is the same graph. What is happening in Ireland with church building is replicating, albeit with tiny little churches, a European pattern of church building that really takes off from about 1,000. And it's all part of a European uh, movement. Um, and we can see it also in the, um, in the record of dateable oak timbers from dendrochronology. And um, I ended up, I had a peripatetic career from geography to economic history to history, and then to the School of Geography, Archaeology, and Paleoecology. So my colleagues were paleoecologists who did pollen analysis and the best tree ring dating laboratory in Ireland with the best dendrochronologist, Mike Bailey, in Ireland. And from their samples, um, you can see uh, when trees started growing. So this is a graph showing dated tree timbers and when the trees, the oak trees started growing. And you can see uh, between 1000 uh, and the middle of the 14th century, the best decade for tree, you know, little acorns starting out as oak trees is the opening decade of the, um, of the 11th century. And then the number of oak trees regenerating goes down and down and down and down. And from dendrochronology, you can see when those oak trees were cut down when they were felled. Okay, so we have fewer oaks, oaks are regenerating. And then these are the felling dates and more oaks are being felled. And so you get to the point from the mid 11th century when you have net depletion, more oaks are being cut down than are regenerating. And if you subtract one by the other, this is a graph that you get. I'm very keen on graphs. I trained as a social scientist. I was always persuading my his history students that you can't do good history without numbers. They're really powerful. Um, and, um, and what you see here is a building boom. And that building boom begins in the middle of the 11th century, 125 to 130 years before the English invaded. Things are happening. Very significant things are happening um, before the English came. This is not something that Orpen really recognized. And the boom decades are the 1130s, the 1140s, a full 20, 30 years before the English got to Ireland. Something the same was happening on the English side of the Irish Sea. So these are monastic foundations. And you can see that the peak decades for monastic foundation in England are exactly these same periods of peak building boom in Ireland. This is why it is the 12th century Renaissance. And tremendously interesting things are happening thick and fast in the middle of the 12th century. And, and shortly after you get this surge in monastic foundations, you get a surge in the foundation of, uh, of boroughs and towns, new towns and boroughs chartered. That's the, these are the bottom graph with the black columns. And then after a lag, you get the foundations of markets and fairs. This is where you can actually see the commercialization happening in the foundation of the institutions required by commerce, towns, fairs, 
markets, places where exchange it can take place and be regulated and where justice can be found by those who are doing uh, the trading. Um, so the English invasion of Ireland was launched from the crest of an economic wave. Powerful centrifugal forces generated by the commercial revolution were thrusting people and merchants outwards into Europe's peripheral regions in a quest for land, for markets, for, for supplies of cheap foodstuffs and supplies of cheap raw materials. Um, and uh, the late Rhys Davies gave a most fabulous series of Wiles lectures at Queen's that I had the great uh, privilege to go to. And the book of those lectures, Domination and Conquest, um, uh, the experience of um, Ireland, Scotland, and Wales deals with these processes, these, centri these centrifugal processes of pushing the English out. They came north into Scotland and, uh, and, and so forth. So this whole centrifugal process is part of this period of expansion and growth. And so from the outset, commercial ambition and, opportuni and opportunism were key elements because if you're going to invade, you need money and you need backers. Uh, this is why we have some sanctions against a certain gentleman in the Kremlin at the present time. They're trying to cut the economic sources of funding from under Russia's feet. So if you're going to invade, you need to finance this. And this is Nicholas Vinson, who I think has been standing here before me as an Edwards lecturer. Um, Jewish and Christian financiers backed the conquest of 1169, not least Robert Fitzharding of Bristol. And Bristol remained central to Ireland's resettlement and trade with Dublin itself, uh, uh, ceded to the King's Men of Bristol as a colonial out. So one of the first things Henry II does when he gets to Dublin is he gives Dublin to Bristol. So the Bristol merchants have backed, uh, have, have backed him. And the, the Irish adventure involved a series of fleets. The greatest of those had to be capable of transporting 500 knights and their mounts. Uh, and the cost here must have been enormous. Well, we know from the pipe rolls what it cost. Um, in, in, in the money of... Um, 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 the early 1170s, it cost £2,852. Well, what's that in today's money? Well, in today's money, that would be £6.2 million. But today, you'd have to pay current wages. You wouldn't be able to get away with paying 12th century wages. You'd have to pay 21st century wages. So if you're paying current, uh, current wage rates, the cost of the invasion would go up to 160 million pounds. But as a share of GDP, what would be the true economic cost of the invasion? And as a share of 12th century GDP, we're talking about an invasion costing 2.85 billion pounds or 3.23 billion euro. It was expensive. And bear that figure, the first figure in mind, 2,852 pounds, because I, I refer back to it uh, later. But once the English got here, um, the project was, uh, of implementation was characteristic of these commercializing times. And here's an outline for, mo for module. I'm just going to give you again the bullet points. First of all, you, uh, if you're an invader, you need to pin down the conquered territory. So you need castles. So you have the encastellation of the conquered territories. Um, uh, church reform and monastic foundation to please the Pope, just to make sure, well, we've invaded a Christian country. We need to kind of uh, uh, justify this. So uh, one of the conditions of the English invasion was that the uh, uh, rather lackadaisical church reform should be pushed much more vigorously by um, Henry II. This is quite controversial amongst Irish historians. Um, uh, but there's a whole, it's all caught up in church reform and the relations um, uh, with the papacy. The existing Norse towns are, are chartered, and, and, and if you go to uh, the Museum of the City of Dublin, they proudly display the foundation charters granted to them by the King of England. And it is full of wonderful ironies if you live there. Uh, this is one of the great ironies. They're particularly proud of the charters given to them by the King of England um, uh, in, the, in the late 12th century. Bumrows and markets are founded. 
colonists are recruited imbued with a commercial ethos. People knew about buying and selling and living by buying and selling, hence the guildsmen uh, coming uh, to Ireland. The countryside is memorialized. Uh, a central administration is established, particularly done by uh, Prince John. Uh, John Lackland, he, had, he was going to inherit nothing, and his dad got him Ireland. And he became Lord John of Ireland. And it was only because Richard II failed to produce a male heir that John then went on to become King of, King of England and bringing Ireland under the English crown in the, in the process. So he sets up a central administration and an exchequer. A new legal system is imposed. Uh, um, Ireland to this day, like England, has the common law. Um, uh, a, a, a sterling coinage is minted uh, and the lordship is integrated in the sterling, into the sterling area. The sterling area is England, Wales, Scotland and Ireland, and the coins move freely between them because they had comparable exchange and they were all of silver. So this is the sterling area. Scotland's in it, England's in it, and Ireland joins it. Um, so you find I Irish coins in Scottish coin hoards, in English coin hoards, you find Scottish coins in Ireland. This is, a, this is an integrated uh, sterling area. Um, there's promotion of domestic and international trade. And these initiatives and innovations change the character of the economic expansion. The expansion is already taking place, but its character is redefined, reorientated, refocused as a result of the English invasion. And it adds, uh, once the shock of the invasion has been absorbed, it adds new impetus to it. Measuring that is not easy. And this is one of the sources we can use. These are monastic foundations in Ireland um, um, from the dates of the foundation charters, many of which are in Rome. So we know when uh, the various uh, monasteries were founded. Uh, and what you can see that, that, that the dotted red line is the English invasion and the great surge of monastic foundations that followed the, the English invasion. So we have a post-invasion boom, which has largely run its course by the 1220s and the 1230s. And what then kind of keeps it going a little bit longer is the arrival of the friars, the mendicant orders come in from the, the 1220s and add a bit more momentum to it. And, um, and from the work from the Irish Historic Towns Atlas, this is one of the studies a little town of Feathered, uh, in County Tipperary, uh, which was founded by William de Brose in the first decade of the 13th century. And we can see there was a, a whole process of town foundation taking place in Ireland, which is at its peak in the first, in the opening quarter of the 13th century. So an uh, important Irish town to this day, Droida, uh, did not exist until it's founded um, in the very end of the 12th century and receives its first charters uh, at that point in time. Kilkenny, a hugely important inland Irish town, um, is chartered and becomes um, a chartered borough um, uh, it, from its first charter in 1207. So there's a whole process of town foundation taking place. And, and clearly commercial and economic confidence came to a peak and it came to a peak in the second quarter of the 13th century. Um, uh, and Dublin, uh, th by then the colonial capital in Ireland, the seat of English power in Ireland with a royal castle, Dublin Castle, built at the command of King John, was booming and it was recruiting free men and guildsmen from far and wide. And there you see a map showing um, the, you know, where, the, where the people coming to become guildsmen in Dublin were coming from. And you see they came from within the Pale area, very close to Dublin, but look at all the, right the way across South Wales, up the Severn Valley, the Southwest of England. They came from East Anglia, they came from Lincolnshire, uh, and they came from uh, the lowlands of Scotland and further south from Scotland. And they were being drawn into the opportunities. Uh, Dublin was like a magnet to these people, seizing the commercial opportunities at this particular point in time. Um, and architecturally, I, I, I'm thrilled to be giving this lecture at a Gothic church, uh, not a 13th century one, a kind of mock 13th century one, but that'll do for me. Um, and um, that optimism is marked by um, the addition 
of a wonderful nave, the finest piece of medieval architecture surviving in Ireland to Christchurch Cathedral um, in Dublin, and then the entire rebuilding of St. Patrick's Cathedral, which is dedicated in 1254, which is the single largest church ever built in the Middle Ages um, uh, in Ireland. Um, and it's at the point where these two spectacular buildings, spectacular by Irish standards, and Roger Stanley would tell you that the nave of Christ Church Cathedral is architecturally Euro of European importance because it's so innovative in its Gothic design. Um, uh, they mark the fortunes the English lordship had its zenith. Nothing as ambitious will be attempted again in Ireland after these two great churches are completed. They are the kind of architectural high point of the whole thing. And then the whole thing hits a plateau and decline sets in. So I want to move on from the boom period to the, to the decline of the lordship. And within a century of the invasion, the Irish government revenues are in terminal decline. And we know this because they're enrolled in the English pipe rolls preserved in the National Archive in England. So these are Irish government revenues, um, including custom revenues from 1275 to 1349. And we can look at the custom revenues separately because they are given in the surviving published reports of the deputy keeper. The original customs returns were destroyed in 1922, but the value of, of the customs received at each port um, are reported in the deputy keeper's reports. And you can see the revenues slide down uh, from the 1280s to a, a very low point well before the, the, the Black Death. And that slump in customers' revenues after 1285 was most precipitous um, in what had hitherto been the most important ports of export, Cork, Yule, Waterford, and, and, and New Ross. You can see they just, the revenues just plunge um, um, uh, at this point, particularly from you know, the peak in the early 1280s, they go down and down and down, never to recover. And this is gonna hit uh, and what they're exporting is wool, wool fells, and hides. So this is going to affect the agrarian economy of the whole hinterland of these English settled parts of the south of Ireland. Um, um, and here is Professor Mary O'Sullivan, who uh, I think is a really a wonderful historian right, whose work has been largely forgotten. So I'm, I'm a little crusade, a really wonderful uh, uh, Wern, who went on to become a member of the Royal Irish Academy, um, and she writes, as far back as the 1280s, in the early years of Edward I's reign, the process of decay had begun and was daily extending throughout the whole system. Now, uh, Edward I achieved a feat which no Englishman has since achieved, not even Boris Johnson. He's become, he made himself even more unpopular north of the border than Boris Johnson has so far achieved. Um, well, I would like to think he would be least popular in Ireland. He was given the Lordship of Ireland by his dad in 1254 as a wedding present. And he never came. He ripped it off persistently until it was bankrupt. A steady drain, Mary O'Sullivan writes, of men, money, and supplies to the English armies weakened the Norman settlement, both at the administrative center and throughout the whole country. Edward I in particular made such heavy demands upon Ireland that before the end of the, his reign, he left the treasury empty, immense debts unpaid, and the government in Dublin virtually bankrupt. Edward II, who at least had the decency to be defeated at Bannockburn, uh, continued the process of exploitation in the most reckless manner. And we can see the effect of this on the port town of Wexford, right the way down in what they call the sunny southeast of Ireland, the, the port for which Edward, uh, Henry II and his entourage departed back to England in 1172. And, and what we find is a, a, a continuous collapse in the, in, in the value of the burgages, the um, uh, burgage rents being paid. They go down from 18 pounds five and six of the 13th century to 11 pounds 18 and six in 1307, down to seven pounds four shillings in 1324. That's a drop of 61% 
in the urban rents being yielded by um, the, the small uh, uh, defended port of, uh, of Wexford. And eventually, about 1312, this is three years before the Scottish invasion, the point was reached when the Irish government, once so prolific of its resources in the service of the crown, found itself dependent upon the English exchequer for survival, and thus it remained. Ireland then became a burden on the English purse, protecting, defending it, uh, where hitherto it had been taken for granted and used as a source of revenue. Um, and the start of that malaise begins a full 30 years before the Scottish invasion of 1315. Um, and this, is, this revision has been about for a long time, so this is going back to the 1960s, and the great James Lydon was very much a proponent of, of, of this view about the, the, the declining state of, uh, and resources of government in Ireland from the 1280s. So what went wrong? What caused Ireland to go from boom to bust? And I'm gonna highlight as an economic historian, six structural weaknesses that prevented this brave new commercializing world from flourishing and prospering. The first is that Ireland had an overwhelming emphasis upon primary production. In this international commercial world, Ireland's comparative advantage when it came to international trade lay in the grass-based production of hides, of fleeces and wool exported to distant markets and grain and lumber exported to closer uh, to Ireland British markets. They were the principal exports, staple products to which value would be added elsewhere, but not within Ireland. Uh, uh, they did not underpin a flourishing manufacturing center uh, in Ireland. And uh, crucial to that export, given the shipping costs and Ireland's geographical location, was cheap land and cheap labor. And the problem was that the commodity was of low quality. Irish wool was of low quality, unlike English wool, which is the highest quality wool available in Europe. Uh, and in fact, um, uh, eventually Flemish uh, woolen weavers would ban the use of Irish wool because the quality of it was too low. So it was a low value product. In return, Ireland imported manufactured and luxury goods and building stone as ballast. And so that discouraged for the development of industrial and other value added activities and service sector activities also remained rudimentary. So it became a very undeveloped economy, a very unsophisticated economy. An economy rooted in primary products for processing and consumption elsewhere. It's basically an agrarian economy. And as a result, a second weakness is the limited size of its urban sector. So then the Norse had founded towns and the English would found more towns. The towns were never large and the urban population was always small. So Ireland remained weakly urbanized. So I reckon that by 1290, fewer than 100,000 people lived in towns of all sizes in Ireland. That's one in 20 of the population living in towns, 19 out of 20 not living in towns. And the largest by far of them is Dublin and it had fewer than 15,000 inhabitants. This is at a time when London has 80,000 and Paris, the largest city north of the Alps, has 200,000. So this is a very small place. Um, so there's no such thing as concentrated urban demand that would stimulate agriculture, specialization, investment and innovation. Urban demand is small and weak, and Dublin is fed within a 50 mile radius and draws, has almost no effect beyond, beyond that area. So you get a blanching economy simply supplying animals, their hides and their feces. Um, um, and um, low urbanization is itself symptomatic of underdevelopment and consistent with low GDP per head, and low per capita demand, demand for goods and services. If you look at, if you look at, if you look at urbanization rates and levels of GDP per head in the world today, you'll find that there's a very 
close, clear correlation um, between them. The more urbanized, generally the higher the GDP per head, the less urbanized, the lower the GDP per head. It's a good proxy um, for levels of development. What you need for development is investment capital. But the problem for Ireland was that its external relations with popes, kings, bankers, merchants, and shippers were asymmetrical. And they promoted uh, indebtedness. And in fact, what was happening was essential investment capital was being siphoned out of Ireland, not being pumped into it. Reform of the Irish church until, until the very end of the 12th century, the Irish church was entirely independent of the church of Rome. And it was only, it was only in the 12th century that you begin to get close relations between the two. And the very controversial uh, papal bull, now de Villeta, 1155, which uh, granted Ireland to the King of England, it thought this is a fake, much contested. Um, um, but one of the things that it says is, uh, ah, if Ireland is part of the brought under the Roman Church, we can receive Peter's pets, we can get money out of it. Um, uh, and, huge, and so as soon as Ireland is brought within the province of Rome, it is taxed. The first uh, clerical tax is 1199, further clerical taxes follow. follow. In the 1240s, a papal representative, John Fusenone, exports 27,000 pounds worth of revenues from Ireland to Rome. Now you compare that with the 2,800 plus pounds, the cost of Edward II's invasion. This is 10 times the cost of invasion. This is a colossal sum of money being exported to Rome uh, from Ireland, depriving Ireland of that investment capital. Uh, the Kings of England follow suit to finance wars and provision armies in Gascony, Wales, and Scotland. The English crown, beginning with um, uh, Henry III, but particularly under Edward I, tax and purvey the, the uh, Irish lordship repeatedly. The Italian merchant bankers, some of my Irish historians probably say, oh, look, there are Italian bankers in Ireland. We're really with it. Why are they in Ireland for what they can get out of it? They're not in Ireland in order to invest in Ireland, they're in Ireland in order to raise revenues and ship them out and to secure more materials. And the trade, most of the trade is handled by non-Irish shippers. So the profits of the trade are not accruing to Irish shippers, they're accruing elsewhere. And so we get a deficiency of coins. And look at this table. These are figures produced by numismatist Martin Allen um, in the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge. Estimated money supply per head in Ireland, Scotland, and England. There is three times more money per head in Scotland as in Ireland, four to five times as much money per head in England as in Ireland. Ireland has the slowest uh, rate of growth of money supply. England has the fastest rate of growth of money supply. There's insufficient money in the economy to promote um, the growth of uh, uh, commerce. It locks Ireland back into a barter economy and not into a monetized economy. Uh, and because it's part of the Stirling area, money minted in Ireland tends to cross the Irish Sea uh, and, and uh, disproportionately. There is a permanent security problem because the conquest is never completed. So there are internal borders and there are enclaves of Gaelic resistance. So those, uh, those enclaves and the incursions of the Gaelic Irish into the settled lands of the, the, of the Lordship, they aid and abet lawlessness. They pose a danger to life and limb. They destroy, deliberately destroy capital stock. And of course they deter investment in fixed or working capital. And by the early 14th century, very few areas were immune to attack. And here's one example. Uh, the great manor of Ferns down in County Wexford, the mighty castle and the cathedral. Um, and uh, 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 as, uh, in 1307 had been valued at almost 39 pounds. And by uh, 1324 has been rendered almost worthless because it has been attacked by the Irish. 
um, and rendered almost worthless. Um, so it's a huge problem. And alongside that goes weak food security. So this is a poor society and it's susceptible therefore to food crises and food crises lead to famine. So we can chart this for the Irish annals. Um, so the dark vertical green lines are years the Irish analysts called us that there was famine, 1203, 1227, 1236. Uh, I have big question marks about here in the 1240s and 1258, but famine in 1263, a terrible famine in 1270-71, another terrible famine 1294 to 96, and then the worst of all, from 1315 to 18, the great Northern European famine, which was made worse in Ireland by the invasion of the Scots. <clears throat> the response to famine is uh, usually theft. Uh, those with the might and the muscle take what they do not have from those who have it. And um, uh, there is a very clear correlation between famines recorded in the annals and attacks and, and, and physical violence. So uh, the famines beget a violent response as people raid and pillage and plunder to get what they need. And this uh, reinforces a predisposition to violence. So this locks Ireland into a vicious circle of underdevelopment and left it unable to cope adequately with a whole series of natural and human hazards which come thick and fast from the 1290s. Uh, and I list, I list them there. The, um, the famine of the 1290s, the heavy taxation to pay for the English invasion of Scotland, the much that money uh, came from Ireland, um, the great European famine, the Scottish invasion of Ireland, and then the great cattle plague of 1321. These are difficult years. And worse, this is happening when the commercial tide is turning right the way across Europe. So if we go back to my chronology of European church building, when does the tide of church building start to ebb? At the very time that, that Ireland's being hit by these other problems. One thing is compounding uh, another. So from the 1280s, there was much that was unique about what was happening uh, in Ireland and the collapse of its economy, but it was not alone in its experience. So there you have two graphs you've already seen. Here's one you have, and this is what's going on in England. This is church building in England, daily real wages in England, which are going down and down and down over the course of the 13th century to a very low point at the end of the 13th century. Estimated GDP per head in Italy, sliding down continuously in the first half of the 14th century. Various measures of the output of the Flemish wool textile industry, the single largest industrial enterprise in Northern Europe at that time. And the tax revenues of the celebrated champagne fairs, which absolutely collapse. Here's Ireland, and the downward trend is unmistakable everywhere. This is again a pan-European pattern. So, so there are unique factors to what's going on in Ireland, but what's going on in Ireland is part of something much bigger. So let me try and bring this to a close. And what we see here is progress unsustained and promise unfulfilled. Does Goddard Henry Orpen's claim withstand scrutiny? Did English rule create the comparative peace and order and the manifest progress and prosperity that Ireland enjoyed during the 13th century? and indeed up to the invasion of Edward Bruce in the year 1315. Well, we can see um, that the Irish economy was thriving before the English got here. Um, and they had this from, uh, from the coin evidence, from the archeological evidence, from the dendrochronological evidence, from references to church building the Irish annals. We can see a lot had been going on since the middle of the 11th century. The, conquest, the invasion and Congress is then a tremendous shock. Um, the poster I chose is a wonderful, great um, historical painting you see in the National Gallery of Ireland by MacLeese. And in the background is the sack of Waterford City by the English. So invasions, as we know at this very moment in time, are very destructive. 
And you see that going on in the background of Maclise's great painting. Um, once the shock of the invasion had been absorbed, by the 1190s, we do see renewed expansion along more commercialized lines. And we see a significant injection of resources, of labor, of human capital and technology. But that only lasted until the 1240s. These were the brief boom years of the Lordship of Ireland. By the 1250s, the possibility that English rule might make Ireland prosperous had passed. External demands by the papacy and the English crown were mounting. Italian bankers are promoting indebtedness. Gaelic opposition was stiffening. And more generally, the European commercial revolution was running right out of steam. Continued progress would have depended upon investment and innovation, but these are stymied by powerful external vested interests who are more interested in siphoning resources out of Ireland than bringing resources and development to Ireland. And I would see Ireland's port towns as instruments of extraction rather than spearheads of growth. And the Lordship's prosperity was always shallow, and it was contingent upon the enduring vitality of European commerce. So when European commerce went into irreversible recession, it took Irish commerce and prosperity um, with it. And as commercial opportunities for peaceful progress um, and prosperity faded, so resort was made to violence. And raiding, plundering, and rustling became means of securing resources. This is a technique still used in parts of Northern Ireland to this day. Little protection money, extraction, thefts of ATMs, and so forth. This goes on all the time. And, and it becomes mutually reinforcing with economic decline. Economic decline and lawlessness go hand in glove and become mutually reinforcing and self-perpetuating. So by the 1310s, the lordship is bust, and it becomes a, a net cost to the crown and not a net source of profit. And Orpen's unionist belief in the benefits to Ireland of English rule, I think, was misplaced. The marriage of Richard de Clare to Aoife McMurrah did not inaugurate an extended era of comparative peace and order and progress and prosperity. Sapped of vital investment capital, early progress proved unsustainable, and the promise of prosperity it appeared to offer remained unfulfilled. So the, the Lordship of Ireland was never an economic success story. It displays all the hallmarks of a poor, underdeveloped, and peripheral economy trading at a comparative disadvantage with Britain and the rest of Europe. And once the European economy went into recession, its fate was sealed. And what sealed its fate was the fall of Baghdad in 1258 to the Mongols. And the whole of the Syrian land route, uh, of the, the Trans-Syrian land routes, the great caravan routes that linked the commerce of the Mediterranean with that of the Persian Gulf and the Arabian Ocean, became a war zone. All these places in the Syrian civil war were part of a civil war that erupted in the late 13th century. And trade had to go taking different routes at greater expense and greater risk. And the whole boom comes to an end. And we can see what we are going to experience in the next few years with the breakdown of the global economy that we've been taking for granted. So my epilogue, and I come to my end, uh, I would say destruction of the Irish Public Record Office 100 years ago has not made us medieval historians redundant at all. We still have a job to do. Um, it has actually challenged us to become more enterprising. And my aim in this lecture has been to draw attention to the rich multidisciplinary array of evidence which does exist and to illustrate how it can be combined uh, to make a critical analysis of the historiography of the, of the period. 
And these are early days, and the full potential of many of the resources I've drawn attention to is yet to be realized. There's much work to be done. There are many PhD theses to be researched and written on this period in Irish history. So serious work to be done. And this is the most exciting thing of all. In the centenary year of the destruction of the public records of Ireland, a project will come to completion and go live in June on the 100th anniversary of the destruction of the four courts, led by medievalist Dr. Peter Crooks of Trinity College, Dublin. And it has embarked on a virtual reconstruction of the entire public record office of Ireland, starting with the original plans. And the image on the left is the original treasury, and the image on the right is their reconstruction, which you can enter and go around on screen in a virtual reconstruction. And um, 100 years after its tragic destruction, the Public Record Office is going to be reborn and reborn virtually. And now is your opportunity to get out your mobile phones and type in beyond2022.ie. And it's a fantastic website with marvelous coverage about the destruction of the four courts, this whole project to reconstruct the contents of them. Uh, uh, and uh, a really exciting account of the work that medievalists are doing with state uh, with army state-of-the-art computer technology uh, uh, to to make this destruction uh, so thank you very much indeed for listening to Thanks very much, Bruce, for that wonderful lecture, uh, just showing us how exciting economic and quantitative history can be and how multifaceted it can be. I almost have this notion 